Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Church Leadership Lab, where we have conversations that help empower healthy churches. I'm really grateful that you are here listening or watching this today. We hope that the conversation we're going to have today is helpful for you. And if it is, we'd love for you to share that with another church leader, uh, someone in ministry that you know, or uh, you can leave a review, you can subscribe, you can do all those things. Helps us to get these conversations into more uh, church leaders' ears. So we would appreciate appreciate that. Uh, Today on the show, we have Kyle Johnson. Uh, Now, Kyle has been involved in building teams, uh, both in the business world and in ministry for over a decade. Uh, He began his professional career with 12 years in corporate retail at May Company, Macy's, and JCPenney. Then after his time in retail, Kyle uh, joined the Igniter Company, uh, Igniter Media, as many of you may know, uh, for seven years, where he was most recently the chief revenue officer. And now he has started his own fraction Chief Marketing Officer, uh, business serving faith-based entrepreneurs who are looking for marketing executive just to come alongside, help guide their businesses. Now, Kyle's also been involved in ministry at Watermark Community Church for 12 years uh, in the lay leadership capacity for multiple ministries. Uh, Kyle and his wife of 10 years, Liz, live in the Dallas area with their four and a half year old son. Kyle actually grew up in Salt or in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and is a rabid St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. And Kyle, as Go a Cubs fan, I forgive you for that, and I still welcome you on to this podcast. Uh, the truth is, is that the Cubs have a more recent World Series uh, than the Cardinals do, and so I, I had to eat humble pie this year, my friend. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And we waited a long time. So we're, I know it was, I think 2016, but we are still savoring that, that world series victory. <laughs> Kyle, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to come on the show to, to chat. Um, we we're going to jump into all things uh, leadership, team building, excited for that. But before we do one question, we always ask everyone on this show is what's something that doesn't make the public bio that, all your your friends and family would know about you. Uh, so I- interesting question, and I love I love to tell the story a little bit in three parts because uh, it comes full circle. Is uh, one, you know, I was saved at a very young age. I want to say uh, I was raised Catholic, but saved when I was thirteen. Put my faith in Jesus, but then was never really discipled. It was more fire insurance than it was, sure. uh, you know, truly allowing Jesus to be Lord of my life. And uh, and so I strayed far in my teens, uh, in my early twenties. And, uh, I say it's by the grace of God that I didn't end up dead or in jail, uh, Mm -hmm. for some of the things that uh, I chose to do. Uh, but in that earlier period of, uh, or in my late twenties, I I actually, when I first got my first job, I was really into competitive video games on the computer. And I would play, so I had a full-time job and I would play 40 hours of counter-strike source, (laughs) <laughs> on top of my full time job, right? Wow. So up till two jobs, I'm playing, yeah, video games, and uh, you know that was very short lived because when you start dating uh, women seriously, they don't necessarily appreciate that level of video game uh, dedication. And, uh, and and when I, you know, full circle, I joined Igniter, and a very small team, right? Um, but when I joined Igniter, they had this cultural thing where every day at five o'clock. They would play a network game of just, you know, 10 to 15 people in the office. They would play Call of Duty 2, which was like the 1998 version of Call of Duty. And it blessed me so much, you know. Uh, And so I got to do a little bit of that of show them off some of my competitive video game skills uh, as part of our corporate culture. But, you know, obviously in in, in a more God honoring way, uh, yeah, probably what I was doing back then in my 20s. My my son is is full in the world of video games. He's thirteen, going on fourteen, and yeah, I f- I find myself having to catch up very very quickly because I'm used to Super Nintendo or N sixty four. I'm like, where do you put the cartridge in? How do you you know? It's like that's dad. That's not that's not how we do it anymore. Is basically what happens. No, so. I mean they have call signs, right? Yeah. and they're on headsets and they're talking to their buddies and they're doing that sort of stuff. Yeah. And so when I was working at JC Penney, I was the men's underwear buyer for almost three years. And I kind of earned the nickname Captain Underpants. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And so 
when we would play Call of Duty at Igniter, that was my call sign was Captain Underpants. So across the building, you know, I would uh, I would I would shoot somebody, kill somebody in the video game. Yeah. And I would hear underpants from across <laughs> the office, uh, you know, so that was always fun. Oh, uh, that's awesome. I love it. Well, we're, we're going to jump in and talk about all things um, building teams, leading teams. Uh, I know that you have a ton of experience, again, in multiple worlds, ministry, uh, business, and doing that. Um, and as we jump in, you know, my, my hope is that there's, there's wisdom people walk away with. Um, and I know sometimes the wisdom we can share is from maybe the mistakes that we've made or that we've seen made. So just as we jump in, maybe in, in your time leading building teams, what are some mistakes either you've made or that you've seen uh, over the years uh, in your experience? Uh, yeah. So what's interesting about leading and building teams is when you first get started, nobody, there's not a lot of training um, <laughs> yeah. for how you do that. Uh you know, and so I think one of the first things that I experienced really early on, and then, you know, there's your natural flesh tendencies uh, of how you want to prefer to manage if you're a conflict avoider or you're an escalator or all these things kind of continue to play out um, as you manage people and teams in high pressure situations. And so I think the first thing that I kind of fell into is I didn't address some underperformers. Um, I didn't address mm -hmm. some of that stuff uh, early on. And, uh, and that created a really bad culture for the team. And mm -hmm. we used to do something called a, a 360 review process. So generally the manager provides reviews for their direct reports. Uh, and a 360 review, you actually get feedback from your direct reports, from your peers and from your supervisor or your boss. And so you kind of get this holistic view of how you're doing. And I actually got anonymous feedback that, Hey, this is a problem that you're not addressing the performance of so and so. Interesting. And it is affecting the morale of the team. Uh, it is allowing the status quo of the expectation to actually lower. Mm. And so people who are driven are are pulling back because you're setting a standard that it's okay. And I think for me, that was a really big lesson and needed that 360 feedback because uh, there was no other natural organic forum in which to have those types of conversations and provide that feedback. So I thought that was really, really helpful. Yeah. And it's interesting that piece you mentioned of the people who were self-driven and really wanting just to run and do well, how that was actually something that for them, they're like, well, A, I don't want to do that. Or um, this isn't the team or the place for me because that's not that's not prioritized. I think that's a really interesting point because people want to build their team with those who are going to run and they sort of guide and direct, um, you know, versus people they have to pull up and push and, you know, try and get to the point where they're going to they're going to really, you know, drive forward whatever they're doing. Yeah, I think another mistake um, that I've seen people do and I've been guilty of is to assume that you are setting the expectation that speed of the leader, speed of the team. Mm. And that can be really unhealthy. Uh, it's depending on everyone's got different capacity, right? Everyone's yeah. got different uh, at home needs or requirements. You know, my life today with having a four and a half year old with special needs looks way different than when I was a single guy in my 20s. Sure. And, and so uh, what I have been trained to say is faithfulness of the leader, faithfulness of the team. And so that leaves a lot of room for capacity, time, um, speed, but, but ultimately some of the core characteristics and values that you're trying to instill in your team is the model that you're trying to get them to emulate. You know, follow yeah. me as I follow Christ in how we serve others, how we do things with excellence, how we communicate, how we're humble, how we're approachable, um, yeah. how we're transparent, you know? And so all of those things are modeled, not look how many emails I can get through, look at how many hours I can work. Yeah. And that can be dangerous. Like if, if it's not clear because then people are killing themselves or just, you know, exhausted because they're like, well, I got to keep up with, with this leader of mine. And that's not always the case. 
Hey, I wanted to take a quick minute and invite you to our next Healthy Church Summit coming up on February 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Now, before you hit that fast forward button, let me tell you about what's coming up. Uh, the Healthy Church Summit is a virtual event centered around how to manage and lead a healthy church and how the latest in church tech can help. Now, this upcoming summit is going to dive into making the most of your time, how you as a church leader can steward your time well. We'll also look at how can you improve your church's digital presence without taking more of your time. Now, we're excited to have with us at the summit, Jenny Katrin from the Foresight Group, Mark McDonald, a church communication and branding expert, Carrie Mayo, our own director of product management, our CEO, Chris Bacon, and it will be hosted by some familiar faces, myself and Casey. Now, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we also have some awesome giveaways for those who register and attend. You could win an iPad Pro, $500 Amazon gift card, lunch for your team, free software, Beats headphones, a Kindle. It's going to be awesome. So do me a favor, click the link in the show notes and make sure you register and join us for the Healthy Church Summit coming up on February 15th, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you there. I know that that when it comes to building a successful team, um, it, it includes more than just high performers, right? People who can, who can get the job done. Um, you need to be aligned ultimately on multiple fronts. And so when it, when it comes to kind of, especially building teams in the church, whether staff, volunteer teams, whatever it might be, what are some buckets that, that you would say church leaders should look at it to see, do we have that alignment? Sure. It's that's, uh, you know, and you got two different buckets that you mentioned there, right? You have you have leaders of leaders, and then you kind of have your your frontline people. Um, and so, for a frontline person, especially on the volunteer side, and even on the staff side, we use the faithful, available, and teachable model, mm. right? They are they are faithful to lean in. They are willing to do the hard work. They care about the mission. Right. They, they are all in available is literally, are they, do they have the resources and time to do this? Are they in a season of their life where this is appropriate? Right. Whatever the ask or job description or even volunteer requirement is right. And then teachable, right. Are they willing to come in or are they willing to get constructive and candid feedback? Are they willing to grow and learn? Right. So from a frontline perspective, we like to say the fat, the faithful, available and teachable. And then when it comes to a leadership level, uh, level, and I don't really know where this came from. This is now like watermark lore. Um, we, we basically, from a leadership perspective, you're looking for three levels of trust. You're looking for spiritual trust, relational trust, and professional trust. And, uh, and all those are almost like bank accounts, right? Mm -hmm. you, you need deposits over time in the spiritual. And so on a ministry level, um, this can sometimes be be easier, right? Uh, in terms of spiritual maturity, that we're aligned on core values, uh, daily devotion to God and His Word, uh, spending personal time with Jesus. But also in the, can you answer some of the elder level questions? Uh, yeah. Can you discern our point of view on uh, gender roles, uh, the sanctity of life, uh, marriage? spiritual gifts and usage of the gifts, like all of these other peripheral things that from a ministry perspective, you have a very specific point of view. And can they answer those? Can they, def do they have words to defend the reasons why they believe what they believe using scripture as support? And that's really hard to do. Yeah. And then if you take that to the business side, in, in my case, uh, well, we're not, you know, necessarily being um, governed by a, a denomination, right? Mm -hmm. um, like it, it's even more challenging. And the the issue is that spiritual is like the foundation in which all of this other stuff is going to stack. And, and if you are very clear uh, and comfortable that your leaders are going to lead their people in a way that is going to honor the Lord, that is going to be true and right to the doctrine that you subscribe to and believe in, um, that you're going to deal with conflict in, in a Matthew 18 type of way. Um, 
then then you don't know how those people are going to be cared for down the line yeah. when you're not in the room. And and also when there becomes uh, misalignments or disagreements about the strategic direction or things that are happening, um, it, it becomes even muddier, right? And so as, as a church leader, your job is to shepherd the flock. Well, you want to make sure the leaders of your flock that are underneath you are aligned. Yeah. And so the next kind of tier is relational. And this is kind of the what we at Watermark would call the one another's of scripture, mm-hmm. right? Are you for one another, outdoing one another in honor? Are you encouraging one another? Are you holding one another accountable? Um, are you uh, confessing to one another? And so there's all of this relational stuff that if you have a strong foundation of spiritual, it should make some of the relational things easier. But even then, uh, I can think of, of, of different people I've worked with that we were not the same personality wise in terms of yeah. wiring. Um, and so there was always friction when there's, when there's, you know, almost exact opposites in terms of wiring. And so you have to lean on the spiritual maturity, that humbleness, that quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, the uh, being first mover to ask for forgiveness. Right. So there's all mm. in a kind of relational bucket having fun with one another. Uh, And then there's professional, right? Which in the business world, you can kind of sometimes want to flip it and you just want to look for people who are absolutely ready to crush the job. Yeah. Um, But, but some of that can actually, if you find somebody that is gifted uh, and fits all the other requirements, you can sometimes train them into the competency to, to execute their job professionally. And that happens for like, like first time front front uh first time leaders of leaders mm-hmm. like if you have the first two you can coach that individual up <clears throat> in competency um at the very top level like your second hand man like you know if you're if you're uh, a senior pastor and you're looking for an executive pastor you probably need somebody to bring in a bunch of professional trust to the table too yeah so uh you're kind of looking for the trifecta there when it gets to the sen- to the senior levels in terms of professional execution but those are the generally the buckets, right? So you got faithful, available, teachable for frontline, and then you have uh, spiritual, relational, and professional trust uh, for managers and managers. Yeah. One of the things is, is you were kind of talking about that is you made the the analogy, and I've, I've you know I've heard it. I'm sure others have about kind of making deposits. Um, and so when you have these when you have these these buckets of trust, like you ultimately need to make some de- some deposits because trust is not it's not always just to set it and forget it. I mean, we're, we're people, we change, we evolve, we're in different seasons. Um, busyness takes us sometimes places where it's like, man, we can't connect and have this relationship, whatever it might be. So I guess my, my question is what are some, maybe some ways you've experienced in the past or you've seen really good leaders who can have a pulse around, do I need to be making some deposits or not? Like, how can you tell the the accounts running a little dry, um, you know, and, and I need to kind of put some energy or attention here? Yeah, that's so that's a really great question. And, and I think you're right. The trust is not binary. Yeah. Right. It's not 100 percent or zero. And so um, trying to be mindful uh, in a world of ministry, which is mostly people driven and, and, and pastoral and it can be very draining from a time and energy perspective that you are making time for, for staff care and, and staff health. Yeah. Um, and so you, you have to basically intentionally have somebody help you uh, as a senior leader to remember that we need to make moments for relational we need to have retreats. We need to have staff funsies. We need to pre-schedule these things so that we have unique shared experiences and can have some relational quality time. Yeah. Um, and, and even as a leadership team, what are you doing to to break away? I don't want to say you know the the devote daily, you know migrate monthly, abandon annually. It doesn't have to be you know all this acronyms that we love, but there needs to be a regular rhythm uh, yeah. of gathering together. Um, no different than what we would say in Hebrews ten twenty four is for believers to to not forsake gathering together. Well, on a leadership team, let's not forsake gathering together for the purpose of not talking business, right? Yeah, and just do it life. Yeah, I think it's interesting even talking about the Hebrews passage, like you know, don't don't neglect meeting together. I think 
I think that principle can be applied far beyond just kind of the gathering of the church. Um, because I've, I've noticed both in, in leading people and in being led that, that often in that vacuum of time together, that's where like narratives start to get written and Mm. we start to maybe believe things that aren't true, but, but we don't have anything in front of us to counteract that. And that's where like, you can kind of start. And I've seen people that's where that's the beginning of, of the end for them as far as being on a team, being at a church, being a part of an organization, whatever it might be. And so, yeah, that relational time is just so important. I, I mean, I think we all experienced that during COVID, right? Whether yeah. it was your with your small group, um, where you're doing FaceTime meetings, or at a business or a ministry where you're not able to gather together physically in a building, that 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 was a really challenging time. Um, where candid conversations are much more challenging. Mm-hmm. You know, two dimensional is great. Uh, it's an incredible tool, but. You know, I don't want to get into the the theology of Hebrews ten twenty four and how that either applies to digital or not to digital. But yeah. there is something said about the physical space and the physical realm and how that creates trust deposits. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I we talked about this a little bit before, actually, and you were sharing in, in some of the things that you kind of learned and, and mistakes maybe that that have been made. But um, I know even if you've been intentional about building the team, you may still have people, um, someone who's not necessarily meeting expectations. Um, and this could be a, you know, an effort thing. I don't want to, or it could just be a, I don't know how I'm not equipped. Maybe it's, they're just in the wrong seat on the bus, whatever it might be. So what do you do when you have a team member who is falling behind and, and as a leader, like, what do you do to, to, to deal with that? Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's different in the business world. Yeah. Right? Uh, coming from, from corporate America where we had performance improvement plans, PIPs, if you will, it was like yep. a 90 day PIP and, and HR was involved and everything was documented. And, you know, it was uh, for legal protection purposes. Right. In ministry, it's family. And, and you deep, you all deeply believe in the mission uh, of the church and the bride of Christ. And, and sometimes, uh, especially when we're younger and we're not as uh, familiar or self-aware of our giftings, right? You can be placed in, in a seat on the bus that isn't necessarily, you're not going to flourish there yeah. personally. And then potentially the ministry aspect isn't going to flourish as well because it's not the best use of your gifts. And so, um, you know, I always like to say that in ministry, you're not trying to kick people off the bus. You're trying to assess are they on the right seat? And then if they're not, can we potentially find a different seat for them? And so what uh, what I have used historically with, with performance challenges is I like to look at um, skill, will. There's a matrix out there. You can Google search it. Um, mm-hmm. Skill, will. But then I throw in talent. And, and there's a difference between skill and talent. Yeah. And, and the way I break that down um, is skill is, do I already have the ability, not, not like cognitive ability, right. Or drive, but do I actually have the resources and training, uh, tools, budget, all that stuff to actually execute the role. And a lot of times if you're, if you're bringing somebody from the outside who maybe had that role, they're already like 50, 60, 70% of the way there. When you're mm-hmm. hiring somebody new into that role, they generally say they only have about 20% of what they need and they have to grow into the other 80%, which is really challenging. Um, and so when you're assessing skills, that's a little bit different in terms of, do I need to get you coaching? Mm-hmm. Uh, do we need to have more one-on-ones? Do I need to get you some books, some training, some courses? Like, what is it? Uh, that I can help get you to the place where where you're actually able to execute the job with competency. But then with will, that comes down to drive. Yeah. And 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 uh, effort uh, and motivation. And so some of that is on the owner uh, of the manager of, hey, I need to do a better job motivating you because you could have a, high, a potential high performer who's, you know, race car in red. Um, because you haven't necessarily created the ability for them to run on green. 
Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, do they need stretch assignments? Are they bored? Um, is, is there a potential uh, different environment, like you're saying, seats in the bus, like where they mm-hmm. can really extrapolate and flourish yeah. uh, and really run some things? And so what I have historically found is stretch assignments are really helpful uh, for those people. Now, if you're talking about someone who's not making deliverables, um, then you need to have a better process in terms of feedback loops of, of making sure they understand expectations uh, and then having quick, closed, candid conversations when those expectations are not met. Because sometimes I've seen historically people, you'll have a conversation, they'll be real motivated. They're crushing it, right? They're hitting deliverables, they're doing great, and then they slip off. So now they've proved it, they can. Yeah. And now they're at a place where they aren't. So it's not that you can't, it's that you, that you're not, or you won't. Yeah. And so we're having a different conversation. Um, and then lastly, it comes down to talent too. And so this one's really hard to assess and talent really comes down to their natural giftings, right? Spiritual gifts, um, strength finders, Enneagram, you know, you're starting into some life coaching stuff here, but then also kind of IQ horsepower stuff. Right. And, and like no one at Igniter was going to ask me to design graphics, right? <laughs> Not my gifting at yeah. all. But when someone wanted a spreadsheet done, I, I'm, I'm the person to call, you yeah. know, when they want to talk through a, a complicated uh, campaign flow or a marketing model, I'm the person that they call, but don't ask me to do any sort of design work. Cause it's going to look hideous. Like my, like my, my son drew it. So, you know, you have to be able to find time to assess those things. But if you're talking about skill, will, and talent, and you're still not in a right fit, then it's trying to find the right seat on the bus. Um, And then eventually, right over time, if it's not a good fit, obviously, you might need a different person on the bus. Yeah. I'm curious with the talent one, is it a, if the person's in the role that certainly like there needs to be some talent. And this goes beyond just whether it's design or, you know, stuff like that. But like, is that one of the things that's kind of a, uh, can be a deal breaker? Meaning if, if that's not there and, and it's clear that that's a struggle, uh, and it's important to the role, is that a deal breaker? Is that something that you can like, we'll get over it by working super hard. If you, if you can work real hard at the skill developing that, and if you have the drive, can you get over a lack of talent? So I'll give you some examples, right? So you were you were a worship leader, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So one of the primary, hopefully, one of the primary skills you have is guitar playing. Yep. And and let's say that uh, uh, specifically in contemporary Christian worship music, it's, it's rhythm guitar playing is even more important than lead guitar playing. Yep. And new song uh, comes out. Pastor wants you to play it. You practice that thing all week maybe for a month and you you've ab- you obviously demonstrated a high motivation high desire high high will to do it um but you you've had the resources maybe you got some training some online training some online video tutorials and different things like that but you can't actually play it it's a little too advanced yeah if that's a recurring problem then we have a bigger picture issue yeah if it's a if it's a singular song that's just a little bit more complicated, you know, I can't play Cliffs Over Dover by Eric Johnson. I just can't do it. Yeah. And uh, it's like, well, it's a complicated song and maybe we can, we can tone that down and maybe skip that one or, or, or do a different version or have someone else lead that day. Right. And so the have someone else lead that day um, is actually something that a lot of organizations will do is that they'll actually take a role where like, Hey, let's say there's six, key job characteristics to this role and you just can't do one of them and we've tried training and you're highly motivated you want to be able to execute it and then we might have to see if there's somebody else that that can supplement that on behalf of the organization um or we don't play that song and we have to we have to decide if that is a critical component to the ministry or is it something that we can god has not provided us with a person to do that therefore do we need to do it yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great <clears throat> analogy to think about because the, and what I hear you saying is there are ways to get around the, the lack of talent, um, but especially self-awareness and things like that. And even maybe 
where the organization is at in general? Like, do you have the resources to have somebody else do it? Do you have, you know, can determine if, if you can get over it or not? I, you know, this is, a, this is a gambling reference, but you, sometimes you get a deal with the hand that God's dealt you. Yeah. You know, and, and God will provide. And, and so if you're trying to push for something that your team is not able to, to, from a talent perspective, execute, you should really consider if that's something that is, you know, is it something we have to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. That's a good word. All right. Well, I'm curious, again, you've, you spanned a lot of different worlds, have a lot of leadership experience. If you could snap your fingers and change a common thought or belief that leaders have, what would that be? No pressure. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> you prepped me. I'm ready. You know? So, um, one of the biggest things I have experienced in my career, and I've seen it happen multiple times, is where you have uh, like an all-star fresh in your role, individual contributor. And you're like, let's make them a manager. Mm. And no one's ready to help those people make that transition. Um, having to delegate this thing that they were great at to somebody else is really hard to do. Yeah. And... And the soft skills of, of people management is so different than the specific skills of an individual contributor that a lot of people don't make that leap. Mm. And, uh, and so a lot of people who have incredible people skills never get the opportunity to be a manager. Uh, and so a lot of times you'll end up, then you'll suffer both sides. You'll now have a manager of people who's not a great at it and doesn't actually have those soft skills. And then you lost the production and excellence that you were getting out of the individual contribution role. And so yeah. it ends up uh, being both. But the kind of natural progression of the world is you start by doing, if you can prove that you crush it, then you get to move to a manager role and then you're a manager of managers. And maybe one day if you know, if God blesses it, you end up being the manager of everybody. Yeah. But uh, I've seen that a lot, that there's not necessarily a path for people who don't have the soft skills that really excel at the individual contribution work. There's no, there's no, I don't want to say career progression, but like there can becomes a point where it kind of tops out, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, the, like what's, what's baked into those, that like that progression you talked about is a growth in salary growth in like just more okay i'm i'm doing things that that are the next step in growth for me i'm you know stuff that not everyone's journey is the same but but by and large is a, is a path that that people look to to move along because your needs are different as an 18 year old versus a 38 year old versus a 58 year old you know um so yeah i i i 100 agree i think that that that's something we just yeah, by and large, and I think the church is included in this. We don't we don't really have a path for people like that who are like, I'm just great at doing this, um, and so I'm with you. If I can, and they're snap happy, and they're happy with you. doing it. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, I'm I'm good at this. I mean, like you said, the skill, will, talent, like all of those things align. Like I, this is my sweet spot. I love this. Um, yeah, it's sort of like great. Like if we could live in a world that's like, then just do that really well. Um, you know, that would be awesome. <laughs> and it's interesting because on the engineering side or, or like the development technology side that does exist. Sure. Right. You don't have to be a manager or a team lead. You become a specialized, you know, uh, chemical aerospace oil engineer, right. Yeah. And you can become, you know, super senior engineer and, and that's okay. Or, or on the development side, you can be a senior developer. Uh, but you don't have to be a team lead, yeah. and that's okay. Uh, but there's a lot of other professions where that just doesn't work. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. that's good. All right, well, um, as we're kind of winding down, this is something I love to hear all of our guests' opinions and thoughts on. Again, our goal is conversations that empower healthy churches. So for you, what's one essential component of a healthy church? Yeah, I do I have strong feelings and conviction around this um, authenticity mm. and whether well, that's in the church or out of the church. Uh, I remember one time at JC Penny, I had someone from HR tell me that I was apologizing to my team too much mm. and that, that uh, could be taken as a, a sign of a weakness, you know? And I was just like, Hey, I disagree. 
And here's why, you know, I, and I'm going to, you know, second Corinthians one, four just talks about, um, that we have all been comforted from the Lord with our struggles in, in, in afflictions so that we can comfort others with the comfort that we've received. I had been forgiven much. Therefore I need to seek the forgiveness when I feel like I have crossed boundaries or stepped over, uh, and caused hurt. And so from an autistic authenticity perspective, like it's got to come from the top yeah. and, uh, if, if you want to breed a ministry of care and love your neighbor as you love yourself and love the Lord, your God with all your heart, then, then we need to show our neighbors that we get it. Mm. We live in a fallen world and it's broken and we're not broken. We're redeemed. Right. And we have hope, but things are still really hard. Yep. And, uh, and just because I'm a believer doesn't mean I don't have health issues that my son doesn't have a genetic disorder that, you know, there aren't financial problems at times that, you know, there are family conflicts, like it, it all, it all exists. Right. Yeah. And so I think when you talk about the elders or the senior pastor from stage being transparent about the struggles that we have in our life, it's almost like a mini devotion because everyone out there is having something. Right. Right. From. Uh, crippling my soul and drying my bones to to light and momentary affliction. Um, and there's a whole spectrum out there. And so by by being too generic, by uh, acting like there's no personal application for the scripture that maybe you're exegeting on stage or whatever, like you're you're breeding almost a fairy tale. Mm. And and from the top, authenticity creates authenticity. And and that's the type of culture that I think creates a healthy church. Now it's not a, uh, it's okay to not be okay, but also it's not okay just to stay there forever. Right. And, uh, and David wrestles with the Lord continuously in the Psalms, right? Questioning him, struggling out loud. And I love that they, the Bible demonstrates that thousands of years totally. later for us. Uh, but also at the same time, he praises the Lord for who he is. He remembers his qualities and characteristics and he will continuously praise the Lord. And so in the same token of being transparent, telling the body, the congregation or the staff, Hey, I'm struggling here, but this is what the Lord's teaching me. Yeah. This is how he's helping me hold fast to that hope. Yeah. That's really good. Well, um, Man, I really appreciate the wisdom that you've shared today. Uh, we, we're we not quite done yet. We do have something we call the final five, which is a little more the rapid final fire. final five. Yeah, so I would love love to jump into that. First one, what's one book that you'd recommend to church leaders? I like two books. You know, if you notice, I I'll haven't stayed it. on script three. Yeah. So, so two books. Yeah. The first one is we're talking about uh, earlier when people get moved into new management roles, no one's... No one's there to coach them and guide them. And, and so the book that I'm recommending is called The, the First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. Okay. Mm. And it's all about managing a leadership transition into a new role. And the premise of the book basically is uh, high individual contributors get dropped into roles they're not qualified for, and there's no training and support. And they will struggle through it. Most people don't make it out. Mm. And so... Even if you do, it takes 60, or I'm sorry, it takes six months, so 180 days to become, uh, add enough value where you surpass the value you're sucking from the organization. Okay. Right. So yeah. realize that as a new manager, a new position, that you are going to take more value than you provide from the first six months, statistically speaking. Mm. Well, what this book is trying to say is we can help you accelerate that to 90 days. So, and it gives you a whole framework about how you structure, what questions to ask, how you're quick to listen, slow to speak, all those types of things as a leader uh, to figure out the quick wins and, and to do those sorts of things. So it's a really helpful book. Um, I had to read it at JCPenney and I probably uh, have lent it out or recommended it a dozen times. Nice. The second book is a totally different topic. It's called The Goal uh, by Eli Goldratt. Okay. And so it's all about the theory of constraints. Now this is very engineering heavy, but it applies to so much in, in life and in ministry and even in business. But basically it talks, it's an, uh, it's a book about a factory and it tells the story and explains the theory of constraints, meaning, um, it's almost like that old reality TV show of like the weakest link, right? Yeah. 
you can always you can all you can only get as quality or quantity of output as your weakest link. And so it talks about how you attack the, that that constraint that bottleneck um, so that you can increase capacity. So in in ministry, right when you want to be people over process, yeah. Well, if you can make the process significantly more efficient, that gives you more time to ca- to care and shepherd the people. Mm. Uh, because the process can cripple you, yep. And uh, and so helping change your mindset in terms of how you how you attack those things and think about those things is always helpful. Yeah, very cool. We'll link to both of those uh, for people to check them out. Uh, next one: What's the last thing that you listen to? Um, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to music. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> we're recording this on November 29th, and so we've already got Christmas tree. Uh, yep. Christmas, Christmas playlist, right? So it's a, I have a Christmas playlist on Spotify that's, you know, Shane and Shane, Matt Maurer, uh, Hillsong United, Kristen Daigle. So it's a whole bunch of, of stuff and it's like yeah. five hours long. And so, um, I want to, we'll talk about this later, but one of my favorite things is, is Google, is Google home automation. And so I have like seven speakers in the house. It's my own eighties intercom system, uh, yeah. that I play the Christmas music through. And, or or I'm I'm kind of a, a a trance electronic music fan, and so I have a group I really like out of the UK called Above and Beyond, and they do a weekly radio show um, that I almost listen to religiously on Monday morning. Nice, it's awesome. Uh, what is your favorite piece of technology? And we we do make a rule: you can't see your phone on this one. No, hold automation. Okay, um, I'm an automation nerd right like uh, i wish i was better at it um because you can always be better but yeah. but having we use google home and there's you know home kit and that's apple's product and uh, alexa and amazon have their own product but basically having my home set up where there are constant alarms uh my my son's uh nighttime you know noise machine off and on schedule his humidifier our ac units uh yeah alarm system like all of this stuff is all integrated and and having that home home automation allows me to like take folders that i need to keep in the front of my file and let's yeah. me stick them in the back yeah right? so that i don't have to worry about did i set the alarm i'm like well no it gets set automatically every day yeah uh, that's cool and having now, a four-year-old where i can tell i can tell google to turn off the tv yeah pretty nice that's nice. You should be like, I didn't, I didn't turn it off. Google did. And so, man, yeah. Google is not worst. responsible. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you, I know that like, is there any reason Google specific that you went with versus Alexa or I haven't heard great things about the Apple one, but um, yeah, is there anything particular? Well, I think, I'm, I'm, I think, I'm, yeah. I'm debating jumping into that world as well myself. So I'm curious. So one, it's funny you have to pick a system. Right, okay. and then everything you do needs to be supported around that system. So I we chose Google B one because the individual the home nests were very cheap. Yeah, you know, no secret they sell that stuff at cost. Right, right. so twenty dollars for one of those little Googles is really really inexpensive. And uh, and we had already had some other infrastructure in terms of alarm system, uh, HVAC and furnace systems, even our washer and dryer. You know, they're all they were all Google compatible. And, okay. uh, and so that was easy for me. Uh, Apple is much more, um, restrictive in terms of who it provides access to into their yeah. network, uh, or else, you know, I'm kind of an Apple fanboy. Everything else I have around me right now is Apple. So yeah, same. Nice. Um, all right, next one. What is a quote or a piece of advice that has stuck with you over the years? Uh, I'll choose one this time and it's lead with a limp. And so what lead with a limp means is uh, you don't always have to have all the answers. Uh, You have a story of grace that God has rescued you from. And the older you get, the more people forget Mm. that. What were you like before Christ? We were all enemies of God, right? Uh, Technically hating him. And, and then he redeemed us through Jesus. And so, I, people are shocked when I tell them some stories about my pre Jesus days, Hmm. you know, and I'm like, Hey, help me never forget that when I run into a non-believer, 
they're doing exactly what their uh, job description for a non-believer should be, yeah. which is sin, sin without the Holy Spirit conviction. Yeah. And, and my job is to love them and care for them and, and, and show them grace and truth. Um, but lead, lead your team to the limp and it's okay. It's okay to, you know, you, you're, you can, you're going to be wrong and mm-hmm. you just own it and apologize and seek forgiveness. Um, and so it, again, it's not aut- authenticity breeds authenticity. You don't, you're not perfect. You don't have it all figured out. None of us yeah. do. So stop trying to act like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right. Last one. What's one thing that you'd like to communicate to our audience of church leaders? Yeah. I said this earlier and I'm going to say it again. In ministry, you chose ministry partially because you want to choose people over process. Hmm. Right. There's a whole bunch of other reasons, right? Why you wanted to be in ministry, but that's, that's one of them. Um, But that a more efficient and effective process allows you to shepherd your flock more effectively. Yeah. And as a senior, senior leader, you're going to have to give an account to the Lord for how you shepherded his flock. I don't have to do that. I'm not on church staff. Right. And so when people say, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be projects over people. It's like, well, guess what? The project can allow you to not, shepherd the flock in a way that you want. And yeah. so um, we talk a lot about an excellent executive pastor, uh, an excellent operations person who is really in there trying to help streamline things and make things more efficient can be a blessing to the body. It's not about more ministry or another ministry or another, you know, like, yeah, it's just like, hey, allowing to have there be more quality time or increasing the ability for reach. Yeah, that's good. Well, man, thanks so much for taking the time just to to share with our audience um, the wisdom, the the things that you've learned, and and the ways that you've grown, led, built teams. Uh, what? How can people uh, connect with you? Follow along with what you're doing. What's the best place for that? Yeah. So, um, I, my website is. Uh, is johnsonstrategypartners.com. Uh, y- you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I don't, I'm not very active on Facebook and Instagram. I let my wife uh, kind of handle those social channels for our family communications, but I, I am yeah. very involved on LinkedIn. You can find me if you search for or for Kyle Johnson Dallas. Cool. Yeah, well, we'll put that. We'll put links to that uh, as well, so people can connect with you. Thank you again so much for taking the time today, uh, and thank you to all of you uh, watching, listening to this. We're really grateful for some time with you, and hope that this conversation has been helpful and that it empowers a healthy churches. That's what we want. Again, if if it has been, we'd love for you to share it, to leave a review, to subscribe, to like, to do all those things. It helps us get these conversations out to more people and to serve more church leaders. So thanks so much for taking the time today, and we'll see you next time. This episode of the Church Leadership Lab podcast is brought to you by Ministry Brands, the largest provider of church technology software. Over 90,000 churches rely on Ministry Brands for their single platform solution that brings together all the digital tools a church needs. From online giving to websites to church management software and more, Ministry Brands is leading the way in simple to use, innovative solutions, all with the goal of empowering healthy churches. To learn more, visit ministrybrands.com.